Hi everyone, my name is Ed Mastriano and I'm the current president of the Community Players, Rhode Island's oldest community theater group, currently celebrating its 100th anniversary. Thank you for joining us for this very special virtual production of Night of January 16th, which is dedicated to the memory of Brian Mulvey, a longtime director, actor, designer, scenic artist, technician, board member, past president, and good friend. This show was chosen because it was the first show Brian directed for the Community Players during our 1993-94 season. We were fortunate that several of the original cast members from that production were able to participate and recreate their original roles. The remaining cast members were specifically chosen because of their connection with Brian through the Community Players. Though this is a free event, any donation to the Community Players in Brian's memory would be greatly appreciated. If you would like to make a donation, please visit our website at thecommunityplayers.org. On behalf of the Community Players Board, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this virtual presentation and we look forward to welcoming you back to the theater soon. Thank you. My name is Kara with Court TV. Today, the Honorable Judge Elizabeth Heath will be presiding, who is known for her tough courtroom veneer. Now, at any moment, we're expecting some of the prosecution's key witnesses to be arriving, and we're hoping to interview them on camera. Oh, Dr. Kirkland. Dr. Kirkland? Yes? Uh, could we interview you for Court TV, please, sir? Oh, yes. Okay, we'll just stand right over here near the camera. Oh, my cataracts. How long have you been in the medical profession? Uh, 37 years. And how long have you been the Providence County Medical Examiner? Uh, well, let's see. My brother-in-law, Bruce, has been governor for hmm, four years. In all your years of experience, have you ever seen such a gruesome body? Uh, I've never seen such a gruesome body. But let me tell you, when they began to draw the chalk line, the beginning point and the ending point didn't meet. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Kirkland. <laughs> oh, uh, Miss Hutchins, Miss Hutchins. What, what I got to do? Oh, just look into the camera and speak into the microphone. Oh, oh, wait. Miss Hutchins, is your, uh, is your husband here with you today? Oh, no, no, my husband, he's home with our 13 kids, you know? Well, Miss Hutchins, is it true that you were working for your husband the night that the murder took place? Oh, I can't talk about that. My lawyer, he told me no. We're going to be on Channel 10. Bye-bye. Okay, well, thank you, Miss Hutchins. Do you know Art Lake? Oh, cut that. Oh, oh, it's Mr. Van Fleet, the, uh, the retired Foster Gloucester police officer. Uh, Mr. Van Fleet, would you like to comment on your early retirement? Well, make it snappy, huh? Because I want to be in and out of this courtroom, huh? Yes, but would you like to comment on your early retirement from the police force? There's no truth to the rumor that I had to retire. I retired under my own volition. You were an eyewitness to the murder. Would you care to comment? Look, I gave my deposition. Then I, you want to hear it again? Listen to the proceedings. Well, how long did you know the deceased? Uh, since October 13th, yeah. Well, would you say that your interest in this case is personal or professional? Professional, of course. How dare you say such a remark like that, you wacko? Oh, well, Mr. Van Fleet. No, that's it. I I'm out of here. <sighs> Let's see if we can uh, get the district. Oh, District Attorney Flint. I'm very confident that the people of Rhode Island will see justice done today. Attorney Stevens, Attorney Stevens. How is your client, Ms. Andre, holding up today? She's holding up very well, thank you. And how do you think your case is going to go? Oh, I feel very confident about our case. Court attention. The Superior Court 11 of the state of Rhode Island, Judge Elizabeth Heath presiding. The people of the state of Rhode Island versus Karen Andrade. Is the prosecution ready? Ready, Your Honor. Is the defense ready? Ready, Your Honor. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you are the jurors who will try this case. At the close, you will retire to the jury room and vote upon your verdict. I instruct you to listen to the testimony carefully and pronounce your judgment to the best of your hearts and minds. You are to determine whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the murder of Bjorn Faulkner and her fate rests in your hands. The district attorney may now proceed. Your Honor, I would like to request at this time that the television cameras be removed from the courtroom. They are an unnecessary distraction to these serious judicial proceedings. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, on the 16th of January, near midnight, the body of a man came hurtling through space and crashed, a disfigured mass at the foot of the hospital trust building. He was thrown or leaped from the roof of his luxurious penthouse. The defense will claim that it was suicide, that this great man was unwilling to bend before his creditors and acknowledge his ruin that he found the fall from the roof of the tallest building in Providence shorter and easier than the descent from the throne of the world's financial dictator. A few months ago, behind every big financial transaction in the world stood that well-known figure with kingdoms and nations in one hand and a whip in the other. Then why should he commit suicide? No one suspected that a gigantic swindle lay at the foundation of the Faulkner Enterprises. No one suspected that the entire business world was in danger of a heart attack. A few days after his death, the earth shook from the crash of his business. Thousands of investors were stricken with paralysis when that monstrous heart stopped beating. Two women ruled his life and his death. Here is one of them, Karen Andre, Faulkner's efficient secretary and a notorious fellow swindler. But there was another, one whom fate had sent him for his salvation. This was the lovely girl who was now his widow, Nancy Lee Faulkner, only daughter of John Graham Whitfield, our great philanthropist. Faulkner thought he had found new life in the innocence of his young bride. He was going to start all over. And the best proof of that is that two weeks after his wedding, he dismissed his secretary, Karen Andre. He was through with her. But ladies and gentlemen, one is not easily through with a woman like Karen Andre. We can only guess what hatred and revenge smoldered in her heart. No. Leon Faulkner did not kill himself. He was murdered. And the state contends he was murdered by the woman you see before you, Karen Andre, that on the night of January 16th, she took her revenge. That is what we are to prove. Our first witness will be Dr. Kirkland. Dr. Kirkland, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Kindly state your name. Thomas Kirkland. What is your occupation? A medical examiner for this county. In the course of your duty, what were you called upon to do on the night of January 16th? I was called to examine the body of Bjorn Faulkner. You found a body greatly mangled by a fall? Oh, yes, extremely mangled. Was that all? No, a closer examination revealed a bullet wound between the fourth and fifth interspace in the region of the heart. What did you establish as the cause of death? It was impossible to determine. It could have been the wound or the fall. In your opinion, could a 32 caliber bullet have caused that wound? Yes, it could. How long had Faulkner been dead when you examined his body? I reached the body about a half an hour after the fall. Judging by the condition of the body, could you say exactly how long it had been dead? No, I, I could not. Uh, owing to the cold weather, the blood had coagulated immediately, which makes a difference of several hours impossible to detect. Therefore, it is possible that Faulkner had been dead longer than half an hour? It is possible. Then he could have been dead before he was thrown off the penthouse? Yes. 
That is all, doctor. You said that Faulkner could have been shot and died before he fell from the penthouse, Dr. Kirkland. But can you state positively that he died as a result of that bullet wound? No, owing to the condition of the body, it was impossible to determine. Is it possible that Faulkner was conscious and able to move after he was wounded? Yes, it is possible. So he could have shot himself and then leaped from the building. He could, yes, but- uh, That's all. Mrs. John Hutchins. Mrs. John Hutchins, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Oh, yes, I do, me. What is your name? Mrs. John Joseph Hutchins. And your occupation? Oh, I ain't got no occupation. I'm just the wife of my husband. What does your husband do? He's the night janitor at Rhode Island Hospital Trust Building. Did Mr. Faulkner have business offices in that building? Oh, yes. And did he have the penthouse on the roof of the building? Yes. And who lived there? Mr. Faulkner did. Oh, that is before he got married. And after his marriage? Well, after his marriage, Miss Andre lived there all by herself. Have you ever seen Mr. Faulkner calling on Miss Andre after his marriage? Yes, one time. And when was that? On the night of January 16th. Tell us about it, Mrs. Hutchins. Well, it was about 10.30. Uh, just a moment. How did you know the time? Oh, my husband, he always goes to work every night at 10 o'clock. But on that night, I worked for him. Why didn't your husband go to work that night? Well, for the last year or two now, my husband, he's kind of lazy bones, you know? So I take his place. Oh, so on the night of January 16th, your husband was a lazy bones. Yes. And it was about maybe 30 minutes after I goes to work that he, the doorbell rang and the, at the private entrance. I went there and I opened the door. It was Miss Andre and Mr. Faulkner was with her. I was surprised me because Miss Andre, she has her own key and, and most times she opens the door by herself. Was she alone with Mr. Faulkner? No, there was two other gentlemen with them. Who were they? Oh, I don't know that me. Had you ever seen them before? No, never. What did they look like? Well, they was tall and sort of thin, both of them. One of them had his hat all crooked over his eyes and his coat collar turned up. He had been drinking. How do you know? Well, Mr. Faulkner and the other gentlemen, they had to help him into the elevator. His, his feet was so loose. Did Mr. Faulkner look worried? Oh no, he seemed very happy. Did he look like a man contemplating self-destruction? What? I mean, did he look as if he would kill himself? Oh, no, unless he died laughing. We <laughs> object, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Oh, what did I do? Nothing at all, just answer the questions. Did the others in the party seem happy too? Yes, yes, they was all laughing when they went up in the elevator except the drunk one. Did you see any of them leave that night? Yes, the first one he left maybe 15 minutes later. Who was that? The drunk one. He come down in the elevator all by himself. He didn't seem quite so drunk no more. <laughs> he could walk, but he, he staggered a little. He still kept his hat pulled down over his face. I wanted to help him to the door, seeing the condition he was in, you know, but he noticed me coming and he hurried out. Did you see where he went? Oh, yes. He got into a gray coupe parked right at the entrance and he drove away really fast. But the cops must have caught him. What makes you think that? Well, I noticed a car started right after him. What car? The defendant will please keep quiet. If Miss Andre will let me do the questioning, I may satisfy her curiosity. 
I was just going to ask, what car, Mrs. Hutchins? Well, it was a big black one, a sedan, I reckon. It was parked side by each, two cars away from the first one. How many were in it? Oh, I saw just one man. What makes you think he was after the first car? Well, I couldn't be sure he was me, but it just looked funny. They started together like that. Did you see that other guest of Miss Andre's leaving too? Oh, yes. He come down maybe 10 minutes later. What did he do? Oh, nothing much. He seemed to be in a hurry, so he went right out. And that left Mr. Faulkner and Miss Andre up in the penthouse alone? Yes. And then what? Well, I went on with my work and it must have been maybe an hour later when I heard screams outside in the street. Then I saw Miss Andre running out of the private entrance. Her gown was all torn and she was really crying. I run after her. We pushed through the crowd outside and there was Mr. Faulkner lying on the sidewalk, all mashed to pieces. What did Miss Andre do? Oh, she just screamed and she fell on her knees. That is all, Mrs. Hutchins. No, 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 that ain't all, no. There's more. More, more what? Well, just then, some people come running up and they tried to tell the policeman something. What did they say? I don't know. You don't know? No. What else? Then the policeman, he took them all up to the penthouse. Did you go with them to the penthouse? Oh, no. Just as I started then, they shut the door right in my face. Then you really don't know any more, do you? Well, no. Now I come to think of it, I, I guess I don't. That's all. <laughs> Just a moment. You said that you had never seen Mr. Faulkner calling on a Miss Andre after his marriage, with the exception of that night. Now tell me, do you always see every visitor who comes into the building at night? No. If the guest has a key to the penthouse entrance, he can come in and I wouldn't see him. In other words, Mr. Faulkner could have called on Miss Andre any number of times and you would not have seen him come in. No. Because I don't spy on people. Whatever they does, I leave it at that me. That is all. You may leave the chair now. Oh, yes. Homer Van Fleet. Homer Van Fleet, you solemnly swear yeah, to tell I the truth. You. Your name? Yeah, Homer Herbert Van Fleet. Occupation? I'm a PI. I'm a private investigator. What was your last assignment? Shadowing Mr. Bjorn Faulkner. By whom were you hired to do it? By Mrs. Faulkner. Were you shadowing Mr. Faulkner on the night of January 16th? I was. Kindly tell us about it. Well, I start off at, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, 16, 16. Yeah, 6.13 in the p.m. And Mr. Faulkner has a nice suit on. He gets in his car in Newport at a fast rate of speed. He drives all the way to Providence all by himself. Where does Mr. Faulkner go? Uh, he uh, drives up to the hospital trust building. He goes in. I wait outside. It's uh, 9.35. Mr. Faulkner comes out with Miss Andre, and she's got a gigantic passage of, of orchids, and they drive away. Where do they go? Well, no one's perfect in this world. What do you mean? I lost track of them. What? Uh, because of the fast rate of speed and, and the accident. What accident? Uh... My car hit a truck, and by the way, Mrs. Faulkner is gonna pay for that, I'm sure. What did you do when you lost track of them? 
Uh, I returned to the hospital trust building and I waited. When did they return? Let's see. Uh, to, uh, 10.30, yeah, 10.30, a great coupe follows them. Mr. Faulkner gets out, helps Miss Andre while she's ringing a bell. Mr. Faulkner opens the door of the gray coupe, a handsome gentleman in a form of clothes, he steps out, and together they help out a third gentleman, and they both, uh, one of them's wearing a gray overcoat, and one of them is uh, inebriated. Then what did you do? I left my car and went to Gary's Grill. I, I, I must explain, when I'm on duty, I always allow myself to take some nourishment every four hours while I'm working. Then I, I, I sit at the window of the building and I watch the door of the hospital trust. What did you observe? Nothing for a while. Then, then this man comes out, he's in a gray overcoat, the tipsy one, and, and, and he starts to, into the car, it gets into the gray coupe, and, and uh, obviously he's in quite a hurry. He drives away. Did you see the other stranger leave? The handsome guy? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Minutes later, he gets in a car which stands there at the curb, and he drives uh, north, yeah. Have you ever seen Mr. Faulkner with these two men before? No, um, first time. I never saw them, no. What did you do when they left? Well, I wait. Mr. Faulkner is now alone in a penthouse with Miss Andre, so I'm curious professionally. So I go up to the nightclub on the roof of the, of the fleet building, and, and there's a, an open gallery uh, off the dining room. You go out, and, and you could see the penthouse. So, so I, I, I go up and I look out. Then what? Uh, uh, I yell. Then what? What do you see? Uh, 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 Miss Canra, uh, Andre, she's in white shimmering gown in the moonlight. A man in evening clothes, Faulkner is leaning against, he's leaning against the, the parapet and she pushes him with all the strength and he goes over the parapet down into space. Then what do you do? I rush back into the dining room. I yell about what I've seen. A crowd follows me back. And we, we find the bloody mess on the pavement. And Miss Andre, she, she's sobbing all over the place. And she's fit to kill. Your witness. Can you kindly tell us, Mr. Van Fleet, when you started in the employ of Mrs. Faulkner? Uh, October 13th. Now, can you tell us the date of Mr. and Mrs. Faulkner's wedding? The 12th of October, the day before. Exactly just the day before. In other words, Mrs. Faulkner hired you to spy on her husband the day after their wedding. So it seems. What were Mrs. Faulkner's instructions when you were hired? To watch every action of Mr. Faulkner and the report back to her in detail. Now, had Mr. Faulkner been calling on Miss Andre after his wedding? I don't know. He, he went to the building there. Every day he must have gone to his office or maybe he's gone up to the penthouse. Maybe she came down. I don't know what's customary. Did you report that to Mrs. Faulkner? I did. Did she seem worried? I, I, I'll tell you how she was worried because she, she said Mr. Faulkner was the most devoted husband and he loved his wife dearly. And just how do you know that? Those are Mrs. Faulkner's exact words. Now, Mr. Van Fleet, can you tell me what time you went up to this private club at the top of the Fleet Building? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, 11, 11.32. 11.32. Mm -hmm. Now, can you tell me how long of a walk it is from the Hospital Trust Tower to the Fleet Building? Uh, yeah, three minutes. Three minutes. Can you tell me what time you got to the window at the club? No, 11.57. 11.57. Now, now you're sure about that? Yeah, 11.57. So it took you exactly 25 minutes to get to the window? What were you doing the rest of the time? Well, they have dancing at the club and other things. And did you partake of the other things? Well, I had a couple of drinks. Now, if I understand the drift of your curiosity, <laughs> but you can't say... I was intoxicated. Oh, I have said nothing of the kind as of yet. Now, you saw Miss Andre pushing Mr. Faulkner off the roof, and it was a little distance away in the darkness, and you were 
well, shall we say, you just had a couple of drinks. No, drinks had nothing to do with it. Are you quite certain that she was pushing him? Isn't it possible that she was struggling with him? Well, it's a funny way of struggling. M Mr. Van Fleet, what yes. were Mrs. Faulkner's instructions to you before you came here to testify? Mrs. Faulkner has not been here to instruct me. As everybody knows, Mrs. Faulkner and her father, he disappeared shortly after Mr. Faulkner's death and haven't been seen or heard from since. Have you heard from them since? I have no record of it. Mr. Van Fleet, can you tell us how much an eyewitness to Mr. Faulkner's murder would be worth to Mrs. Faulkner? We object, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Exception. That's all, Mr. Van Fleet. Just a moment, please. Mr. Stevens. Yes, Miss Andre. Uh, excuse me, what kind of car do you drive, Mr. Van Fleet? A brown coupe. It's old, but it's serviceable. Five more payments, and it's mine. Mm. Did you see any car following the gentleman in the gray coats when he drove away, Mr. Van Fleet? I can't recall. There was a lot of traffic, man. That's all, Mr. Van Fleet. Yeah. Elmer Sweeney. Elmer Sweeney. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, ma'am, I do. Your name? Elmer Sweeney. Your occupation? <laughs> Policeman. Hey, you know, this is a great city to work in. Only been on the job about a year now. I already seen the arrest of a mayor, a superior court judge. Yes, but on the night of January 16th, were you at the scene of Beyond Faulkner's death? Oh, yes, ma'am. Right there. That hardly happened when I got well, there. Did you question Miss Andre? Oh, no, not right away. Before I could do anything, that fellow Van Fleet rushed up with this crowd of people uh, and started yelling how he had seen Karen Andre push Faulkner off the roof. How did Miss Andre react to that? She started laughing. I thought she went crazy. What did you do? I took her right up with us in the elevator to examine the penthouse and the roof. Did you find anything unusual? Oh, I say I did. As soon as the elevator door opened, I couldn't believe my eyes. Right there on the roof, there was a garden. There, there were trees and plants. I mean, there it was, the night of January 16th, and there was orchids growing. It was beautiful. What was the first thing you did? I turned the shower on. Why did you do that? Well, a couple of guys at the station house told me that when Mr. Falkton lived there, he liked to bathe in wine. I wanted to see if it was true. Was it true? If it was, the service had been discontinued. But did you find anything connected with Faulkner's death? Oh, oh, that. Yes, ma'am. A, a letter in the dining room. I saw it the moment I went in. Where was it? It was propped up on the center table. Miss Flint! Miss Flint! Mrs. Faulkner, your honor, please, this is a witness I have been trying to locate. Very well. We have searched everywhere for you, Mrs. Faulkner. Well, I went to Texas for a quiet rest, but I saw in the papers that you wanted to call me as a witness and I hurried back. Father brought me here by airplane. I want to do my duty toward the memory of my husband. If there's anything we can do to help y'all, Miss Flint, we are at your disposal. I can only express my deepest appreciation, Mr. Whitfield. If you will kindly take seats, I will be ready for you in just a little while. Um, you can sit right here. He objects, Your Honor. This is an attempt to influence the jury, a trick to make them face Mr. Faulkner's widow throughout the trial. Your Honor, the defense counsel has no right to dictate where I seat my witnesses. Silence. I shall allow it. Objection overruled. Exception. A moment ago, you said you found a letter. Yes, ma'am, in the dining room. Is this the letter? The very same. How did you get hold of this? Please read it to the jury. If any future historian wants to record my last advice to humanity, I'll say that I found only two valuable things on this earth, my whip over the world and Karen Andre. To those who can use it, the advice is worth what it has cost mankind. Signed, Beyond Faulkner. 
Submitted as evidence. Accepted as exhibit A. Was that all you found? Oh, I should say not. Out on the roof garden, uh, I found a gun. It was about this big and- uh, I will now show you a 32 caliber pistol. Is this the weapon you found? The very same. Hey, you got all of that too, huh? Submitted as evidence. Accepted, exhibit B. Where did you find it? It was lying under a chair. I picked up the gun with my handkerchief. I always watch out for fingerprints. The barrel smelled strongly of powder, which showed that it had just been fired. Did you ask Miss Andre whose gun it was? Yes, ma'am. She said it was hers. How did she explain the shot? She said that Faulkner had been unhappy, that he wrote the letter and left it there in the dining room and ordered her not to touch it. Then he opened the drawer and grabbed that gun. She saw what he was going to do and struggle with him. In the struggle, the gun went off and Mr. Faulkner was wounded in the chest. Miss Andre told you that the gun was in Faulkner's hand when it went off? Yes, ma'am. She was positive about it? Said it three times. Was the gun examined for fingerprints? Oh, sure, at headquarters. We have here the results of that examination. Were the police able to identify the fingerprints? Yes, they were. And whose were they? Karen Andres. And did that gun show any fingerprints other than Karen Andres? Not a one. Submitted as evidence. Accepted, exhibit C and D. Now, after the gun went off in Faulkner's hand, what happened next, uh, according to Miss Andre? She said that Faulkner dropped the gun and yelled that she couldn't stop him, and before she knew it, he had leaped off the roof. Did you ask her who had been with them that night? Yes, ma'am, I did. She said two gentlemen had, that they were friends of Mr. Faulkner, and that she had met them for the first time that evening while having dinner with Mr. Faulkner. And Ms. Andre told you that she had never seen those two men before? Yes, ma'am. Was she very emphatic about that? Oh, yes, ma'am. Couldn't shake her. That is all. Ms. Andre told you that she had struggled with Faulkner to prevent his suicide. Did you notice any evidence of a struggle in her clothes? Yes, sir. Her dress was tall. Uh, it had diamond straps and one of them was broke. So she had to uh, hold the dress up like this with one hand. I was so embarrassed. That's all. Jane Chandler. Jane Chandler, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Oh, help you, God. I do. Your name? Jane Chandler. Your occupation? Handwriting expert of the Providence Police Department. Exhibit A. Please, do you recognize this letter? Yes, I understand it is a letter found in Mr. Faulkner's penthouse on the night of his death. I had been called upon to examine it. And what were you asked to determine? I was asked to determine whether it was written by Mr. Faulkner. What is your verdict? Certain peculiarities in the handwriting lead me to the conclusion that this letter was forged. Your witness. Ms. Chandler, it was called your attention during the inquest that Ms. Andre was in the habit of signing Faulkner's name to unimportant documents at the time she was employed as a secretary. Have you compared these signatures with Faulkner's real ones? I have. And what is your opinion of them? I can compliment Ms. Andre on her art. The difference is very slight. Well, bearing that in mind, isn't it impossible to tell the difference between Faulkner's real handwriting and Ms. Andre's imitation? It's a very difficult task, but we have means of determining the difference. What are the means? Well, one is the microscope, which reveals certain vibrations and certain shadings of the pen, according to the nerve condition of the writer, which cannot be imitated. How often are your handwriting experts wrong in your decisions? I object, Your Honor. If Your Honor, please, this is a perfectly legitimate question. I, I wish to establish that this is not an exact science. Your Honor, this has been accepted as an exact science by all the courts for a number of years. And if this lawyer doesn't know that... Order, counselors. I will sustain the objection. Ms. Chandler, in view of the similarity of their writing, isn't there a reasonable doubt that this letter was a forgery? Well, of course there can be a doubt, but it's not That's very all. light. 
Thank you. That's all. Mrs. Faulkner. Mrs. Faulkner, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. What is your name? Nancy Lee Faulkner. What relation were you to the late Bjorn Faulkner? I was his wife. When did you first meet Bjorn Faulkner? In, in August of last year. Where did you meet him? At a ball given by a friend of mine on Long Island. You have heard about Bjorn Faulkner's reputation as the most ruthless of men. Did you find him so in your first meeting? Not at all. He was perfectly charming and considerate that first night I met him. You see, he told me later that I was the first woman he had ever met whom he could respect. When did you see Mr. Faulkner again? Um, about three weeks later, I invited him to dine at my home in Newport, just an informal little dinner with, with father present. Did you see him often after that? Yes, quite often. His visits became more and more frequent until the day until the day? Until the day he proposed to me. Please continue. We went driving, Mr. Faulkner and I alone. We stopped on a, a lonely little road. I'm sorry. It's, it's a little hard for me to think of those days. Then suddenly, Mr. Faulkner seized my hand and looking straight at me, he said, I love you, Nancy. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Faulkner. If you wish to be dismissed now and continue tomorrow. And this is a subterfuge staged to gain the sympathy of the jury. I object to that remark. And I demand a fair trial for my clients. Man, would you like, there will be no interference with my witnesses. The jury will ignore these remarks. I am sorry, Mrs. Faulkner, for this interruption. Please proceed. Then uh, Mr. Faulkner told me for the first time the truth about his fortune, that it was gone. He said that he could not ask me to marry him because he had nothing to offer me. But I loved him. I told him that his money meant nothing to me. Did Mr. Faulkner feel hopeless about the future? No, not at all. I told him that it was our duty to save his enterprises our duty to the widows and children whose savings had been entrusted to him. He said my faith in him was, was like a great driving force propelling him forward that he could not fail. How could he think of suicide? Did you remain in Rhode Island after your wedding? Well, yes, we made our home in my Newport residence. Mr. Faulkner gave up his Providence penthouse. I never really cared for the view. Did Mr. Faulkner tell you anything about Miss Andre? Not then, but two weeks after our wedding, he came to me and he said, Dearest, I feel that I must tell you about the secretary who has served me so long. And I said, you don't have to say a word if you don't want to. He said, I must. My marriage to you has become a sacred troth that has regenerated my soul and the past can have no part in it. Then he said, Karen Andre is the cause and symbol of my darkest years. I am going to dismiss her. What did you answer? Well, I said, we must not be cruel. Perhaps you can find another position for Miss Andre. He said that he provide for her financially, but that he never wanted to see her again. Tell me, what did Mr. Faulkner do on the day of January 16th. He spent it in town on business as usual. He came home late in the afternoon. He said that he had to dine with three friends that night. It was a business deal. So he did not have dinner at home and he left about six o'clock. Who were the three friends? He did not tell me and I did not ask. I made it a point never to interfere with his business. Did you notice anything unusual when he said goodbye to you that night? No, not a thing. He kissed me goodbye and said that he'd try to come home early. I followed him to the door and I, I watched him drive away. I stood there for a few minutes thinking, 
how happy we were, what a, a perfect dream our love had been, a, a beautiful, uplifting relationship based on mutual trust. How could I know that this love through jealousy would bring about his, his death? Your Honor, we object. Move that be stricken out. Strike the last remark. Thank you, Mrs. Faulkner. That is all. Will you be able to answer a few questions now, Mrs. Faulkner? As many as you wish, Mr. Stevens. So you said your romance was like a perfect dream, didn't you? Yes. Um, a, a sacred troth that regenerated a soul. A beautiful, uplifting relationship based on mutual trust. Yes. Then why did you hire a detective to spy on your husband? Well, well I, 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 I didn't hire a detective to spy on my husband. I hired him to protect Mr. Faulkner. Protect him? Will you kindly explain that? Well, you see, some time ago, Mr. Faulkner had been threatened by a gangster, uh, uh, Larry Regan. He refused to pay any attention to it, but I was worried. So as soon as we were married, I, I hired Mr. Van Fleet to watch him. I did it secretly because I knew that Mr. Faulkner would object. How could a detective following at a distance protect Mr. Faulkner? Well, I didn't think that, that the underworld would dare attack a man who was constantly watched. So all Mr. Van Fleet had to do was watch Mr. Faulkner? Yes. Mr. Faulkner alone? Yes. Not Mr. Faulkner and Miss Andre? Mr. Stevens, that supposition is insulting to me. Oh, I haven't noticed you sparing insults, Mrs. Faulkner. Oh, well, I'm very sorry, Mr. Stevens. I can assure you that I intended no such thing. You said Mr. Faulkner told you he never wanted to see Miss Andre again. Yes, he did. And yet after your marriage, he gave her the most luxurious apartment in Providence, his penthouse. Your detective told you that, didn't he? Yes, I knew it. Well, how do you explain that? I cannot explain it. How can I know what, what blackmail she was holding over his head? How do you explain the fact that Mr. Faulkner lied to you about dining with three friends on the night of January 16th and instead went directly to Miss Andre's house? If I could explain that, Mr. Stevens, I might be able to save you the bother of this trial. We would have an explanation of my husband's death. All I know is that she had made him come to her for some reason, which he could not tell me, and that he was found dead that night. That's all, Mrs. Faulkner. Your Honor, may I ask her a question? Granted. Did you love Bjorn Faulkner? I did, Miss Andre. And how can you speak of him as you did? Don't you know why he married you? But Your Honor, please. How can you sit there and lie about him because he can't come back to defend himself? Your Honor, why should I be questioned by the woman who murdered my husband? Mrs. Faulkner. What is it? One of us is lying, and we both know which one. Father! Father! There will be a 15 minute recess in which time the jury will be sequestered. attention the superior court 11 of the state of rhode island judge honorable elizabeth heath presiding you may be seated the people of rhode island versus karen andre i noticed a great deal of levity amongst the jurors i certainly hope you were taking this seriously the district attorney may proceed magda spenson Magda Svensson, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I swear. What is your name? You know it, you just call me. Kindly answer my questions without argument. State your name. 
Magda Svensson. What country did you come from? A Sweden never come from any country but Sweden. What is your occupation? I've been housekeeper. By whom were you employed last? By Herr Bjorn Faulkner, and before that by his father. How long have you been employed by them? I've been in the family 38th year. I remember Herr Bjorn since he was a little kid. When did you come to America? I've been here five years. And what were the duties Mr. Faulkner assigned to you? I keep pet house for him. I stay even after he go when he get married and give pet house to her. But I never employed by this one. Now, Mrs. Svensson. Miss Svensson. I beg your pardon, Miss Svensson. That's all right. What did you know about Miss Andre's connections with Mr. Faulkner? A decent woman like me shouldn't know about such things, but sin is shameless in this world. Tell us about it. From the very first day this woman come, she tried to get her claws on Herr Faulkner. It is not a good thing when secretary forgets to secretary. You mean she was in love with Faulkner? Oh, only the heart can love, but she have no heart. No, she wants to know too much about Herr Faulkner's business. Was Faulkner in love with her? He married to the other woman. A good man never loves double. <laughs> then why did Faulkner insist on keeping her? Well, before he know it, she learned so much about his business, he cannot let her go. And when she knows she got her claws on him, she make him spend much money on her. You just try to count up all the money that he based on that woman. Can you give any instances of his extravagance? Well, I can so. He had a platinum gown made for her. Yes, I said platinum. Fine mesh, fine soft as silk, and she wore it on her naked body. She had a fire in the fireplace and she hated the dress. She asked me to put her on her as hot as she could stand. And if it burned her shameless skin, she laugh like the pagan she is and say it was man kissing her wild like tiger. Your honor, we object. These are facts pertaining to the vital questions of this case. What's your honor? Silence, counselors. Miss Svensson, kindly word your testimony with a little more modesty. Sin is sin, judge, any name you call it. How did Mr. Faulkner act at the time of his marriage to Miss Whitfield? Oh, he was happy for the first time in his life. He was happy like decent man that found the right road. Did you know of anything that made him worry in those days that could bring him to suicide eventually? No, nothing. Now tell us, Miss Fenson, what was Miss Andre's attitude toward the other woman? Oh, she's silent, like stone speaks. But I hear her crying one night after marriage, crying, sobbing, that the first only time in her life. Why was she crying? No, I not know. All women cry sometime, I mean, just to cry. Was she crying because she had lost Faulkner? Oh, no, not her. If she lose one man, will she find another? I seen her kissing another man on the same night of her Faulkner's wedding. What man? I not know the man. I seen him first that night of her Faulkner's wedding. Tell us about it. Now, I go to the wedding. Ah, it was beautiful. My poor hair be all so handsome and the young bride all white and lovely as a lily. Oh, I just cried like looking at my own children. Ah, but she not go to wedding. Well, did Miss Andre stay at home? Mm, she stay home. I come back from wedding early. I come in the servant's door, but she not hear me. She was home all right, but she was not alone. Who was with her? Here was the man out on the roof in the garden. I see them. He held her in his arms and kiss her, the sinner. And then? Oh, she step aside, say something, but I not hear. She speak very soft. He not say a word, but he just take her hand and hold it. He hold it so long. I get tired waiting and I go back to my room. Did you see the man leave? 
No, I did not. Did you see him again? Yes, once. And when was that? The night of January 16th. Tell us about it, Miss Benson. There. She ate very strange that day. She, she called me and said, I have the rest of the day off, and I, I have been suspicious. Why did that make you suspicious? Well, it was Wednesday. That, uh, my day off is, is Thursday. I don't ask for a second day, so I said I not need day off, but you know, she said she not need me, so I go. What time did you go? About four o'clock. But I want to know secrets, so I come back. When did you come back? Oh, about uh, ten at night. The house is dark. She's not home, so I beat. And a half hour after, I hear them come. I I seen a hair fork them with her, so I, I afraid to stay. But before I go, I seen two gentlemen with them. One gentleman, oh, is so drunk. Who is he? I not know him. Did you know the other one? The other one? Oh, he the same man I seen kissing Miss Andre on wedding night. That's all, Miss Benson. Just a minute, Miss Benson. You still have to have a little talk with me. Uh, for what? I say all I know. You may know the answers to a few more questions. For instance, you stated that you had seen the stranger making love to Miss Andre. Yes, I did so. But you also stated you could not hear what was said. Now remember, you're under oath. If you couldn't hear them, you can't really swear that he didn't make love to her, can you? No, but I can't swear that he didn't either. Can you really swear you saw him kiss her? With my own two eyes, I saw the sinner do it. Well, after all, what is so sinful about a boy kissing a girl? Listen, mister. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you are too young to be experienced. But I know that a kiss is last door in heaven before a girl falls into hell. Let's confine ourselves to this kid. Now, you said it was dark when you saw him for the first time? Yes, it was dark. And on the night of January 16th, when you were so ingenuously spying on your mistress... You said that you saw her come in with Mr. Faulkner, and you hurried to depart in order not to be caught. Am I correct? Hmm. You have good memory. You just had a swift glance at the two gentlemen with them. Yes. Can you tell us what the drunken gentlemen look like? How can I? No time to notice face, and too dark at door. Oh, so it was too dark to identify the drunken man, and yet you were able to identify the other man you had seen but once before. Let me tell you, mister, I'm under oat, as you say, and I'm religious woman and respect oat. I said it was the same man, and I say it again. What do you think? I know nothing about men. That is all. Thank you, Miss Fenson. If your honor, please, the prosecution has one more witness to introduce. Mr. John Graham Whitfield. John Graham Whitfield, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. What is your name? John Graham Whitfield. What is your occupation? I'm president of the Whitfield National Bank. Were you related to the late Bjorn Faulkner? I was his father-in-law. It is obvious, Mr. Whitfield, that you are well qualified to pass judgment on financial matters. Can you tell us about the state of Mr. Faulkner's business immediately preceding his death? I should say it was desperate, but not hopeless. My bank made a $200 million loan to Mr. Faulkner in an effort to save his enterprises. Needless to say, that money is lost. What prompted you to make that loan, Mr. Whitfield? He was the husband of my only daughter. Her happiness has always been paramount to me, but my motives were not entirely personal. Realizing the countless tragedies of small investors that the crash could bring, I felt it my duty to make every effort possible 
to prevent it. Is it possible that you would have risked such a considerable sum in Faulkner's enterprises if you believed them hopelessly destined to crash? Certainly not. It was a difficult undertaking, but I felt that the crash could have been prevented had Faulkner lived. He therefore had no reason to commit suicide as far as his business affairs were concerned? He had every reason for remaining alive. Now, Mr. Whitfield, can you tell us whether Mr. Faulkner was happy in his family life, in his relations with your daughter? Miss Flint, I would like to state that I have always regarded the home and the family as the most important institution in our lives. You therefore will believe me when I tell you how important my daughter's happiness was to me, and she had found perfect happiness with Mr. Faulkner. Mr. Whitfield, what did you know about Mr. Faulkner personally? Well, it is only fair to admit that he had many qualities of which I could not approve. We were as unlike as two human beings could be. I believe in one's duty to others above all. Beyond Faulkner believed in nothing but himself. From your knowledge of him, Mr. Whitfield, would you say you consider it possible that Mr. Faulkner committed suicide? I consider it absolutely impossible. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. That is all. Mr. Whitfield, were you very fond of your son-in-law? Yes. And you never disagreed with him, never lost your temper in a quarrel. Oh. Mr. Stevens, I do not lose my temper. If my memory serves me right, there was some kind of trouble at the time you made that stupendous loan to Mr. Faulkner. Purely a misunderstanding, I assure you. Oh. Well, I admit that Mr. Faulkner made a, a somewhat unethical attempt to hasten that loan, which was quite unnecessary, since I granted it gladly for my daughter's sake. You said that your fortune had been badly damaged by the Faulkner crash. Yes. And your financial situation is rather strained at present? Yes. Then how can you afford to offer a $200,000 reward for the arrest and conviction of Larry Regan? Objection? What does that to do with this case? Your Honor, I would like to have the privilege of explaining this. Very well. I did offer such a reward. The gentleman commonly known as Larry Regan is a notorious criminal who specialized in extorting money for so-called <laughs> protection. He had not only menaced Mr. Faulkner, but had also threatened to kidnap my daughter. I offered that reward for evidence that would make his arrest and conv conviction possible. Mr. Whitfield, can you tell us why you and your daughter disappeared so suddenly shortly after the night of January 16th? I think the answer is obvious. My daughter was crushed by the sudden tragedy. I hastened to take her away to save her health. You love your daughter profoundly. Yes. You have always made it a point that her every wish should be granted. I can proudly say yes. When she or you desire anything, you don't stop at the price, do you? Well, Mr. Stevens, we've never had too much. Then would you <laughs> refuse to buy her the man she wanted? Mr. Stevens! You wouldn't stop it if it took your entire fortune to break the first unbreakable man you'd ever met. Your Honor, we object. Objection sustained. Exception. Now, Mr. Whitfield, perhaps you will tell us that your money had nothing to do with Mr. Faulkner dismissing Miss Andre, that no ultimatum was delivered to him. You are quite mistaken in your insinuation. My daughter was not in the least jealous of Ms. Andre. I'd be careful of statements like that, Mr. Whitfield. Remember that your daughter was elevated to the high state of matrimony by purchase. Your Honor, we object. Father, father! Why, you impudent upstart! You, I could crush you like a worm, much as I crushed others that are better than you. And that is just what I wanted to prove. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. That is all. Your Honor, we move that the defense counsel's outrageous remark, which led to this incident, be stricken out. 
strike out his last remark. The prosecution rests. Your Honor, the defense moves that the case be dismissed for lack of evidence. I can't believe what you just said. Motion denied. Exception. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we cannot pass judgment on Karen Andre without passing it on Bjorn Faulkner. He had put himself outside all human standards. Whether it was below or above them is a question for each of us to decide personally. But I'll ask you to remember that he was the man who said he needed no reasons for his actions, that he was the reason. The man who said that laws were made for the weak, that the strong were the laws. If you remember that, you will understand that the financial condition into which he was thrown in his last months was so intolerable to him that in order to escape it, he would resort to the most desperate means, including suicide. And that is what the defense will prove. Our first witness will be Sigurd Jungquist. Sigurd Jungquist? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. What is your name? Sigurd Jungquist. And what is your occupation? My last job was secretary to Air Bjorn Faulkner. How long have you held that job? Since beginning of November, since uh, Miss Andre left. What was your position before that? Bookkeeper for Air Faulkner. And how long did you hold that job? Five year. Did Mr. Faulkner give you Miss Andre's position when she was dismissed? Yeah. And did Miss Andre instruct you in your new duties? Yeah, she did. What was her behavior at that time? Did she seem to be angry, uh, sorry, or resentful? No, she was very calm, like always, and explained everything clear. Did you notice any trouble between Miss Andre and Mr. Faulkner at that time? Air lawyer, there can be no more trouble between Air Faulkner and Miss Andre as between you and your shadow. Now, tell me, have you ever witnessed any business conference between Mr. Faulkner and Mr. Whitfield? I have never been present at conferences, but I see Air Whitfield come to our office many times. Air Whitfield, he not like Air Faulkner. Just a moment. If Your Honor, please, I would like to report this incident, which I consider a hoax. A man has just called on the telephone and insisted on talking to me immediately. When informed that it was impossible, he gave me the following message just brought to me. Do not put Karen Andre on the stand until I get there. No signature. I want to go on the stand right away. May I ask why, Miss Andre? Question me now, Mr. Stevens. I'm afraid it's impossible, Miss Andre. We have to finish the examination of Mr. Youngquist. Then hurry. Hurry. Why the hurry, Miss Andre? Whom are you expecting? You don't have to answer, Miss Andre. And but in view of such strange behavior. Silence, please. I shall ask the defendant to refrain from interrupt further interruptions. This ruling should apply to the district attorney. Order, Mr. Stevens, another outburst of this kind and you're going to be in contempt of court. Proceed with the examination now. Before this interruption, you had said that Mr. Whitfield didn't like Mr. Faulkner. Now, what made you say that? I heard what he said one day. Air Faulkner was desperate for money and Air Whitfield asked him, sarcastic, what he was going to do if his business crashed. Well, Air Faulkner shrugged and said, oh, commit suicide. Air Whitfield looked at him very strange and said, very slow. If you do, be sure to make a good job of it. That is all. Your witness. Mr. Youngquist. Where were you employed before you started with Mr. Faulkner? I, I worked for bank in Stockholm. But you were not working there at the time immediately preceding your job with Faulkner. No. Where were you at that time? I was in prison. So, you were in jail on what charge? Embezzlement. From your employer? Yeah. You absconded from your bank with 300,000 kroner, didn't you? Yeah, I did. But Air Faulkner helped me to get out of prison. He gave me a chance to go straight. Oh, he gave you a chance to go straight so that you could help him go crooked? 
You have been employed by Faulkner for five years, haven't you? Yeah. Did you know all that time that he was crooked? No, I did not. Do you know now that he was involved with questionable financial dealings? No, I do not know that. You don't, huh? And you didn't know what all those brilliant financial operations of his were? I knew that Air Faulkner did what other people could not do, but I know it was not wrong. How did you know that? Because he was Air Bjorn Faulkner. Ah, I see. The king could do no wrong. When people like you and me meet a man like Bjorn Faulkner, we take off our hats and we bow, and we take orders, but we don't ask questions. Splendid, my dear Mr. Youngquist. Your devotion to your master is worthy of admiration. You would do anything for him, wouldn't you? Yeah. Are you very devoted to Miss Andre too? Miss Andre served Air Faulkner. And such a little matter as a few lies for your master's sake would mean nothing to you? I have not lied. Air Faulkner is dead and cannot tell me to lie. But if I had choice, I'd lie for Bjorn Faulkner rather than tell truth to you. For which statement I am more grateful than you can guess, Air Youngquist. That is all. Your Honor, the defense would like to call Karen Andre. Karen Andre. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? That's useless. I'm an atheist. The witness has to affirm regardless. I affirm. What is your name? Karen Andre. And what was your last position? Secretary to Bjorn Faulkner. Tell us about your first meeting. I saw him for the first time in his office in Stockholm. He was alone. I had come in answer to his advertisement for a sonographer. It was my first job. How did Faulkner greet you? He got up and didn't say a word, just stood and looked at me. No one could stand his gaze very long. I didn't know whether I wanted to kneel or slap his face. I didn't do either. I just told him why I had come. Did he engage you then? He said I was too young and he didn't like me but he threw a stenographer's pad at me and said, get down to work, I'm in a hurry. And I did. And you worked all day? <laughs> all day. He dictated as fast, almost faster than he could talk. He didn't give me time to say a word. He disliked everything I did. He didn't smile once and he never took his eyes off me. He acted as if he were cracking a whip over an animal he wanted to break. What happened when you had finished? When I finished, I told him I was quitting. He looked at me and did not answer. I put on my things and started out. He tapped on his desk once. I stopped. After a moment, he said quietly, tomorrow at nine, here. I went out without a word. That night, I could not sleep. His eyes were always on me. The next morning, I was in his office at nine. And you worked and planned and rose to success together. Yes. Can you tell us the extent of Faulkner's personal fortune at the height of his success? He had no personal fortune. He always said that the world belonged to him who could use it. So he took what he wanted. In business, when he owed money to one of his companies, it was crossed off the books and charged the accounts of several other concerns. And thus he balanced his books. It was very simple. Why did a man of Mr. Faulkner's genius resort to such methods. He wanted to build a gigantic net, a net over the world, and he wanted to build it fast in his lifetime. So when did Mr. Faulkner's business difficulties start? Over a year ago. Tell us about it. All his corporations had begun to need money at about the same time. So we could no longer transfer a charge from one concern to another without throwing the other into bankruptcy and thus revealing the weakness of our whole financial position. What did you do? A $200 million loan was necessary. We tried to get it from the Whitfield Investment Corporation, but Whitfield refused it until his daughter came into the picture. And how did that happen? Bjorn met her at a party. She soon made it obvious that she was greatly interested in him and he kept up the acquaintance for diplomatic reasons. Then one day Bjorn came to me and I'd never seen him pale before. And he said, 
Karen, we have only one piece of collateral left and you're holding it. You'll have to let me borrow it for a while. I said, certainly, what is it? He said it was himself. I asked, for Nancy Whitfield? And he nodded. I didn't answer at once. It wasn't very easy. Finally, I said, all right, Bjorn. Had Mr. Faulkner proposed to Miss Whitfield? No, <laughs> she had proposed to him. And how do you know that? He told me. She took him for a drive, stopped on a lonely road, turned to him point blank and said, what's the use of pretending? I want you and you know it. You don't want me and I know that, but I have the price. He asked him, what is the price? She said, a certain $200 million loan you'll need to save your business. It's a lie, a shameless lie. How can you make things up about me like that? Quiet, please. Anyone disturbing the proceedings will be asked to leave the courtroom. What was Mr. Faulkner's answer to that, Miss Andre? <laughs> he said, it is costing you an awful lot of money. She said, money has never meant anything to me. Then he said, will you always remember that it's a business deal? And she answered, you'll have your money and I'll have you. Such was the bargain. Was uh, Mr. Whitfield eager to accept that bargain? Bjorn said he thought Mr. Whitfield would have a stroke when he heard about it, but Miss Whitfield insisted. She always had her way. In other words, Faulkner sold himself as his last security. Yes. Did you resent that marriage? No. We had always faced our business as a war. And when any war reaches a crisis, someone has to be sacrificed. The time for my sacrifice had come, but it was harder for him than for me. Then why did Mr. Faulkner dismiss you two weeks after his wedding? He was forced to do that. Whitfield refused to advance the money until it was done. Well, what reason did he offer? It was Miss Whitfield's ultimatum. I had to be discharged. And did Mr. Whitfield grant the loan after you were dismissed? No. Bjorn took it. How did he take it? By forging Mr. Whitfield's signatures on $200 million worth of securities. And how do you know that? I helped him to do it. <laughs> did this $200 million help Mr. Faulkner? Only temporarily. Bjorn had stretched his credit to the utmost and there was no more to be had. How did Mr. Faulkner take this situation? He knew it was the end. What were his plans? You don't find men like Bjorn Faulkner cringing before a bankruptcy commission. And you don't find them locked in jail either. And the alternative? He wasn't afraid of the world. He had come into it as its master. He was going to leave it when and how he pleased. He was never going to let- Karen, stop, please. I, I told you to wait for me. Regan, Larry Regan. Larry, you promised to stay away. What is the meaning of this? Karen, you don't understand, you don't- Your honor, I demand that this man may not be allowed to testify. Why not, Miss Andre? Silence, order. That's the man I see kiss her. That's the man, the sinner. Admit him. Your honor, this man loves me and he'll do anything to save me. He'll lie. Don't Karen, believe what he says. Karen, your sacrifice is useless. What do you mean? Beyond Faulkner is dead. Dead? You're on trial for his murder. Didn't you know he was dead? No, she didn't know it. When she was arrested for Faulkner's murder, he was still alive. But he is alive. No, Karen. He's alive. You're lying to me. Not Bjorn. Not Bjorn. He's waiting for me. I don't believe it. I won't believe it. I'm going to call a 15 minute recess. Miss Andre, you must try to compose yourself. The jury will be sequestered. Court attention, the Superior Court 11 of the State of Rhode Island, the Honorable Judge Elizabeth Heath presiding. You may be seated. The people of the State of Rhode Island versus Karen Andre. Ready, Your Honor. If Your Honor, please, I want to report that I have issued a warrant for Larry Regan's arrest as he is obviously an accomplice in this murder, but he has disappeared. 
He was last seen with the defense counsel. And I would Keep like- Keep your to shirt on. Oh, who disappeared? What do you suppose I'd appear for? Just to give you guys a thrill? You don't have to issue any warrants. I'll stay here. If she's guilty, I'm guilty. The defense may proceed. Your Honor, the defense would once again like to call Karen Andre to the stand. Ms. Andre, when you took the stand earlier, did you know the whole truth about this case? Mm, no. In view of certain circumstances which have arisen, do you wish to retract any of your testimony? No. When you first took the stand, did you intend to shield anyone? Yes. Whom? Bjorn Faulkner. Do you still find it necessary to protect him? No, it's not necessary anymore. Do you still claim that Bjorn Faulkner committed suicide? No, Bjorn Faulkner did not commit suicide. He was murdered. I didn't kill him. Please believe me. I don't care what you do to me now, but you cannot let his murder remain unpunished. I'll tell you the whole truth. I've lied at the inquest. I've lied to my own attorney. I was going to lie here, but everything I told you so far has been true. Now I'll tell you the rest. Before we recessed, you're about to tell us Mr. Faulkner's way out of his difficulties. I told you he was going to leave the world when and how he pleased, but I didn't mean that he was to kill himself. I did push a man's body off the penthouse, but that body was dead before I touched it. It was not Bjorn Faulkner. Please explain this to us, Miss Andre. Bjorn wanted to be reported as dead, but he did not want any searches or investigations afterwards. So he decided to stage a suicide and then disappear. I was to go with him. He had the plan in mind for a long time. He kept $80 million of the Whitfield loan for the purpose, but we needed someone to help us, someone who could not be connected with Bjorn in any way. There was only one such person we knew, Larry Regan. What made you believe that Regan would help in so dangerous an undertaking? He loved me. And he agreed to help you in spite of that? He agreed because of that. What was the plan, Miss Andre? Regan was to get a corpse. On the night of January 16th, Lefty O'Toole, a hitman, was shot by rival gangsters. Regan stole his body. O'Toole's height, measurements, and hair were the same as Bjorn's. He was the man I pushed off the penthouse. Was that the extent of Mr. Regan's help? No. Regan used to be an air pilot, and he was to get an airplane and take Bjorn to South America. That day, January 16th, Bjorn transferred the 80 millions to three banks in Rio de Janeiro under the assumed name of Ragnar Heden. A month later, I was to meet him at the Hotel Continental in Rio. Until then, the three of us were not to communicate with each other. No matter what happened, we were not to reveal the secret. Tell us what happened on January 16th, Miss Andre. Bjorn came to my house that night. I'll never forget his smile when he stepped out of the elevator. He loved danger. We had dinner together, then we went to Regan's place. He had O'Toole's body in a gray overcoat and hat. The three of us drove back to my house with the body. Bjorn wanted to be seen entering the building, so I didn't use my key, I rang the bell. We were dressed formally to make it look like a party. Bjorn and Regan supported the body as if he were a drunken friend. The wife of the night janitor opened the door, then we went up the elevator. And then what happened? Bjorn exchanged clothes with the corpse. He wrote the letter and propped it up on the center table where anyone could find it. The three of us had a drink, then they carried the body out and left it leaning against the parapet. Then, then we said goodbye. Bjorn was to go first. He went down the elevator I stood and watched the door close and he was gone. And then? Regan followed him a few minutes later. They were to meet 10 miles out of the city where Regan had left his plane. I stayed alone for an hour. The penthouse was silent. I didn't want to wait out in the garden with the body. I lay on the bed in my room. There was a clock by the bed and it ticked in the darkness. I waited. 
When an hour passed, I knew the plane had taken off that Bjorn and Regan were on their way to South America. I got up, I tore my dress to make it look like a struggle. Then I went to the garden. I looked down, the world seemed so far away. Then I took my gun and I fired a shot into the air to explain the gun wound in O'Toole's body if it were discovered. I must have been nervous. I forgot all about the fingerprints. Then I dropped the gun and pushed the body over. I thought all of Bjorn's troubles went with it. I didn't know that his life went too. That is all, Miss Andre. Miss Andre, you said that you lied at the inquest. Yes. And you lied to your attorney. Yes. And the story you have just told us here is entirely different from the one you came into court prepared to tell? It is. Then why should we believe a word of it? How are we to know when you are lying, when you are telling the truth? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Now tell us, Miss Andre, didn't Mr. Faulkner have a clear conception of the difference between right and wrong? Bjorn never thought of things as right or wrong. To him, it was only you can or you can't. He always could. And you? Didn't you object to helping him in all his deceptions? <laughs> to me, it was only he wants or he doesn't. You loved Bjorn Faulkner? Yes. Such as he was? Because he was such as he was. Exactly, Miss Andre. Now, what would you do if a woman were to take away from you the man you worshiped so insanely, if she changed the ruthless brute you loved into her own ideal of an upright man? Would you still love him? Your Honor, we object. Objection sustained. But I want to answer. I want the district attorney to know that she is insulting Bjorn Faulkner's memory. You do. But you thought nothing of insulting him while he was alive by dividing your love with some mafioso? Why, you lousy- oh, No, don't, Larry. You're mistaken, Miss Flint. Regan loved me. I didn't love him. And he didn't demand your love for his help. He demanded nothing. You didn't ask him to help you take revenge on your first lover? No. Why so particular, Miss Andre? Is there much difference between a swindler and a gangster? We object. Sustained. You said you were the only one who knew all the details of Faulkner's financial activities? Yes. You had enough information to send him to jail at any time? I'd never do that. But you could, if you'd wanted to. I suppose so. Well, Miss Andre, isn't that the explanation of Faulkner's visits to you after his marriage? He had reformed. He wanted to avoid a crash. But you held it over his head. You could expose him and ruin him. And before he made good for his crimes, which was it that held him in your hands? Love or fear? Bjorn never knew the meaning of the word fear. Miss Andre, who knew about that transfer of $80 million to Rio de Janeiro? Bjorn, myself, and Regan. Not just yourself and Regan alone? With your knowledge of Faulkner's business and your ability to forge his name, couldn't you and Regan alone have transferred that money? That would not have been necessary. Bjorn would have given me the money had I asked for it. Now, Miss Andre, Bjorn Faulkner kept you in extravagant luxury? Yes. You hated to change your mode of living. You hated to see him turn his fortune over to his investors to see him poor? No one was ever to see him poor. No, of course not, because you and your gangster lover were going to murder him and get the 80 million no one knew about. Your Honor, we object. She's badgering the witness. Sustained. You've heard it testified that Faulkner had no reason to commit suicide, that his marriage to Miss Whitfield had given him the first happiness he'd ever known. And you hated him for that happiness, didn't you? You don't understand Bjorn Faulkner. Well, maybe I don't understand him, but let's see if I understand you. You formed a partnership with a criminal the first day you met him. With him, you defrauded thousands of investors the world over. You cultivated a friendship with a notorious gangster. You participated in a $200 million forgery. This you told us proudly 
flaunting your defiance of all sense of honesty. And you don't expect us to believe you are capable of murder? You're wrong, Miss Flint. I am capable of murder for Bjorn Faulkner's sake. That is all, Miss Andre. Lawrence Regan. Lawrence Regan. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. What is your name? Lawrence Regan. What is your occupation? I'm uh, unemployed. How long have you known Karen Andre? About five months. Where did you meet her? In Faulkner's office. I went there to uh, do some business with him. I gave up the business because I met his secretary. How did you happen to become friendly with Miss Andre? Well, that first meeting wasn't exactly friendly. She wouldn't let me see Faulkner. She said I had enough money, enough money to buy orchids by the pound. I had no business with her boss. I said I'd think it over, and I went. I thought it over, only I didn't think about the business. I thought about her. The next day, I sent her a pound of orchids. You ever see how many that makes? That's how it started. Did you know Miss Andre loved Mr. Faulkner? I knew it even before I met her. What? What of it? I knew it was hopeless, but I couldn't help it. You never expected Miss Andre to share your feelings? No. You never made any attempt to force them upon her? You have to know all that. I'm afraid we do. Uh, I kissed her once, by force. It was the night of Faulkner's wedding. She was alone. She was unhappy. I was crazy about her. She told me it was no use. I never wanted her to know, but she knew. We never mentioned it since. When did Miss Andre first tell you of Faulkner's plans to escape to South America? About two weeks before we pulled it. Was Lefty O'Toole one of your men? No. Were you connected with his murder in any way? No. You actually had no definite knowledge of his planned murder? No, I just have a way of guessing these things. What happened on the night of January 16th? Well, it all worked out as Miss Andre told you, but she only knows half the story. I know the rest. Tell us what happened after you left the penthouse. I left 10 minutes after Faulkner. He had taken my car. I had one of my men leave another car for me at the door. I stepped on it full speed. Where did you go? The North Central Airport, 10 miles out in Lincoln. I had left my plane there earlier in the evening. Faulkner was to get there first and wait for me. What time did you get there? About midnight. There was a bright moon. I turned off the road and I could see the tire tracks in the mud where Faulkner's car had passed. I drove into the lane and then I thought, I lost my mind. The plane was gone. So what did you do? Well, I searched around that lane for two hours. Faulkner's car was there where we had agreed to hide it. It was empty. Lights turned off, the key in the switch. I saw the tracks on the ground where the plane had taken off, but Faulkner couldn't have fly that plane himself. Were there any clues to this mystery? Yeah, I, f I found a car hidden. What kind of car? Uh, it was a big black Lincoln. And then what did you do? Well, I wanted to know whose car it was, so, so I smashed out the window, crawled in the back seat, and settled down to wait. How long did you have to wait? The rest of that night. And then? Well, then the owner came back. I saw him coming. His, his face looked weird. He had no hat. His clothes were all wrinkled and grease spotted. What did you do? I pretended to be asleep in the back seat. I watched him as he approached. He opened the door. Then he saw me. He gave out a start yell as he'd been struck in the heart. His nerves oh, then, must have been jittery. Well, then what did you do? Well, I wakened. I stretched. I rubbed my eyes and said, oh, it's you. Fancy such a meeting. I don't think you liked it. He asked, who are you? What are you doing here? I said, my name's Guts Regan. You may have heard of it. I was in a little trouble and I had to hide for a while. And finding this car here was quite a convenience. He said, that's too bad, but I'll have to ask you to get out. I'm in a hurry. Did you get out? Nah, I stretched and asked, what's the hurry? He said, none of your business. I smiled and explained, it's not for me. You see, it happens that a certain communist is a friend of mine. And he appreciated a story about a gentleman of your prominence found wandering in the wilderness at milkman time. But I'm sure he'd like to have the whole story. And what did he say? Uh, he said nothing. He, uh, he took out a checkbook and looked at me. I shrugged and looked at him. Then he said, would $50,000 be suitable token of appreciation to keep your mouth shut? <laughs> I said, he'll do. Lawrence Regan's the name. He wrote out the check. Uh, here it is. 
I offer this check in evidence. What's all this nonsense? Who was the man that wrote out that check? Who was the man, Mr. Regan? Ah, let the clerk read it to you. Kindly read the check. Pay to the order of Lawrence Regan, the sum of $50,000. Signed, John Graham Whitfield. Wow, it's an outrage. I demand to see that check. We offer this check in evidence. Objection. Objection overruled. Admitted into evidence. What did you do after you received this check, Mr. Regan? I put it in my pocket and thanked him. Then I drew my gun and stuck it in his ribs and asked, now you lousy bastard, what did you do with Faulkner? Your honor, is this man to be allowed to make such statements? Mr. Whitfield, the witness is allowed to testify. If it is proved to be perjury, he will suffer the consequences. Proceed, Mr. Stevens. What did he answer, Mr. Regan? Uh, at first he muttered, I don't know what you're talking about. But I jammed the gun harder and I said, cut it out. I got no time to waste. I'm in on it and so are you. Where'd you take him? He said, if you kill me, you'll never find out. Did you get any information out of him? Not a word. I didn't want to kill him yet. He said, if you expose me, you'll expose a fake suicide and Faulkner will be found. I asked, he said, I asked, is he alive? He said, uh, go and ask him. I've talked and threatened. It was no use. I let him, I let him go. Thought I could always get him. Then did you try to find Faulkner? I didn't lose a second. I rushed home, changed my clothes, grabbed a sandwich in an airplane, and I flew to Rio. I searched. I advertised in the papers. I got no answer. No one called at the banks for Ragnar Heaton's millions. Did you try to communicate about this with Miss Andre? Nah, we had promised to stay away from each other for a month. And she had been arrested for Faulkner's murder. I laughed when I read that. I couldn't say a word, not to betray him if he was still alive. So I waited. What were you waiting for? February 16th at the Hotel Continental in Rio. I set my teeth and waited in every minute of every hour of that day. He didn't come. Then? Oh, then I knew he was dead. I came back to Rhode Island and I started to search for my plane. We found it yesterday. Where did you find it? I was in a deserted field in South County. I went and took a look at it. I recognized the plane by the engine number. It had been landed there and set fire to. Was the plane empty? No, I found a, found a body of a man in it. Could you identify him? Yeah, no one could. It was nothing but a burnt skeleton. But the height was the same. It was Faulkner. I examined the body or what was left of it. I found two bullet holes, one in the rib over the heart, the other straight through the hand. He didn't die without putting up a fight. Must have been disarmed first, shot through the hand, then murdered, defenseless, straight through the heart. That's all, Mr. Regan. Your witness. Just what is your business, Mr. Regan? You'd like me to answer that, wouldn't you? Mr. Regan, what do you do when prospective clients refuse to pay you protection? Well, I'm uh, legally allowed not to understand what you're talking about. Then I will try to make it clear. May I question you as to whether you read the newspapers? You may. Well? Question me. Would you kindly state whether you read newspapers? Occasionally. Did you happen to read that when Mr. James Sutton Vance Jr. refused to pay protection to a certain gangster, his magnificent Narragansett home was destroyed by an explosion just after the guests left, barely missing a wholesale slaughter? What was that, a coincidence? A remarkable coincidence, Mrs. Flint, just after the guests left. Did you read that when Mr. Van Dorn refused to pay- We object, Your Honor. Such questions are irrelevant. Stained. So you had no ill feelings towards Mr. Faulkner for the um, failure of your business with him? No. Oh. Now, Mr. Lawrence Regan, what would you do if someone were to take this woman you love so much and throw her aside merely because he had found someone else with more money? I'd uh, cut his throat with a dull saw. You would? I would. And yet, 
You expect us to believe that you, Larry Regan, gangster, outlaw, scum of the underworld, would step aside with a grand gesture and again throw the same woman you love back into the arms of the same man? Your Honor, we object to this line. I, I loved her. You did? Then why did you allow Faulkner to visit her after his marriage? Well, I had nothing to say about that. You two didn't hold a blackmail plot over his head. You got any proof of that? Her association with you is the best proof. Objection. Sustained. How did you kill Faulkner in the penthouse that night? Objection. Sustained. You deny having any part in Faulkner's murder? I do. You deny you were an accomplice to that murder? I do. But you admit knowledge of the fantastic plot which Miss Andre has just described? I do. To what extent did you participate? Mrs. Flint, I merely provided the corpse. And nothing else? Nothing else. Exhibit B, please. Do you recognize this gun? No. Perhaps I should refresh your memory. This is the gun found in the penthouse. The gun Miss Andre claimed she fired in the air. The gun she claims was hers. Now do you recognize it? No. Affidavit, please. I have here an affidavit which states that a 32 caliber pistol, serial number CC3490, was sold by a store in New Jersey to Lawrence Regan. Just a minute, Ms. Flint. I'd like to take a look at that affidavit. There is no CC3490 on this gun, Miss District Attorney. No. Did you ever hear of the heat test? No. The serial number on this gun has been filed off, but when heated red hot, it still discloses the serial number CC3490. This is satisfactory, Ms. Flint. Submitted in evidence. Accepted. Exhibit F. You admit being with Mr. Faulkner and Miss Andre in the penthouse on the night of January 16th. I do. And perhaps you will tell us where is your other accomplice, the man who played the drunk? Left the old tool? I can give you his exact address. Swamp Point Cemetery, Whitfield Family Memorial, which is the swankiest place Paul Lefty's ever been. Now let me get this clear. You claim that the man buried at Swan Point Cemetery is Lefty O'Toole? Yes, in the same corpse that was thrown from the penthouse. And the man you found in the burned plane was Bjorn Faulkner? Yes. Who's to say it isn't the other way around? Supposing you did steal O'Toole's body, who's to say that you didn't stage that fantastic thing yourself? that you didn't plant the airplane and the body in New Jersey and then come here today with this wild story in a desperate attempt to save Miss Andre. You've heard her tell us you'd do anything for her, that you'd lie for her, murder for her. We object, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Where's your real proof, Mr. Regan? Mrs. Flint, you are a district attorney and I, well, you know what I am. We both have a lot of dirty work to do. Such happens to be life, almost of it. But do you think we're both so low that if something passes us to which one kneels, we no longer have eyes to see it? I loved her. She loved Faulkner. That's our only proof. That's all, Mr. Regan. Your Honor, the defense rests. Are there any witnesses in rebuttal? Your Honor, if you please, the prosecution has one. Roberta Van Rensselaer. Roberta Van Rensselaer? You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Certainly, why not? Your name? Real or professional? Both, if you don't mind. I don't mind. My real name is Ruby O'Toole, but if we should ever get friendly, don't call me Ruby. I hate that name. But professionally known as Roberta Van Rensselaer? That's my nom de plume. I'm a Terpsichorean. You mean you dance? Yeah, that's the common name for it. Where were you last employed? At the Foxy Lady. No cover charge. Who was your employer? The owner, George Lefty O'Toole. Were you related to him? No, I was his wife. 
I see. Now tell me, do you know Larry Regan? I've met the rat. I take it you have a much affection for him? If we were cast off together on a lonely island, it would still be lonely. Why do you dislike him? Because he killed Lefty O'Toole. We object, Your Honor. Strike it out. You must forego your personal opinions, Miss Van Rensselaer, and confine yourself to the facts of your personal knowledge. Did O'Toole and Regan do business together? No. If Lefty had stooped that low, he would have broke his back. Then would you say they were rivals? Well, Larry might say so, but Lefty just considered him an, an amusement, like uh, golf or video poker. When did you see Regan last? See him or hear from him? See him. About a month before Lefty was rubbed out, Regan came over to the club one night to see Lefty, and Lefty had me sit at the table and listen. He always did that because Regan had been trying to muscle in. And what did Regan want that night? He said he wanted to sell out. Did that surprise you? You could have carried me out on a spoon. Was O'Toole interested in the proposition? No. He said Larry don't sit long enough in one place to get a shine on his pants. Why did he want to sell out? Well, his story is he's leaving the country for good. He described the Jane he had on the run and a, and a lot of important money she's going to have and how they were going to South America to put the equator between them and the income tax boys. Did he mention who the woman was? No, but, but Lefty knew. He said it was some Jane working in Faulkner's office, but it wouldn't do him any good because Faulkner would stop him. What did Regan say to that? He said Faulkner was going away for good. And Lefty says, you plan to erase him? And Regan answers, no, he's going to commit a fake suicide and won't he be surprised when he finds out it's real. Objection, Your Honor. This is hearsay and not admissible. Overruled. Exception. Do you recall the rest of the conversation? They talked about a price for his interests and Lefty said he would think it over. When did you hear from him again? On January 16th, Regan phoned the house and asked for Lefty. I put Lefty on the phone and after they talked, Lefty said he was going out to Johnston to meet Regan and settle the deal. And he left the house to meet Regan? Yes, to go to Johnston. He was put on the spot in the landfill. He was killed that same night? Yes, and an hour after, his body disappeared. Your witness. You are the widow of George O'Toole? Yeah. And you admit that you hate Lawrence Regan? I swear to it. Haven't you allowed that fact to influence your testimony? How do you mean? I mean that you're here to get revenge and that you relate things which you know nothing about. For instance, you said that Regan was losing money. How could you possibly know that? We kept better books for Regan than he kept for the government. You said your husband met his death on the 16th of January. Yes. And it is rumored that he was put on the spot by rival gangsters. Yes, and the man who did it was sitting Please right there. Please your answers to the questions I put to you. You believe he was killed by a rival. It couldn't possibly have been anyone else. But you didn't consider Regan a rival. Isn't that what you just said? But you don't have to consider a, a skunk your rival because you're trying to keep him off your farm. That is all. Killing Lefty O'Toole was the dirtiest trick that any- That is all, Miss Van Rensselaer. It was dirty, Judge. Any more witnesses? Your Honor, please, I would like to recall John Graham Whitfield. Mr. Whitfield, have you any objection if I ask for a court order to examine the body in Swan Point Cemetery? I have no objection, Mr. Stevens. That body has been cremated. Cremated? Why was that done, Mr. Whitfield? The body was in such condition that uh, it seemed the best thing to do. And for no other reason? Well, it's been my gust of my family for years. Mr. Whitfield, where were you on the night of January 16th? I was at home. Have you any witnesses to that? Mr. Stevens, you must realize that I'm not in the habit of providing myself with alibis. I've never had reasons to keep track of my activities and produce witnesses for them. But if you insist, I believe I spoke to my daughter. What cars do you own, Mr. Whitfield? Four. What are they? One of them is a black Lincoln, as you are so evidently anxious to learn. May I remind you that it was not the only black Lincoln in New York City. You have just returned by plane from Houston, Texas. 
Yes. You flew it yourself? Yes. You're a licensed pilot then? I am. And yet that story of Mr. Regan's about you're running away with his plane and burning it in South County is nothing but a lie in your opinion. It is. Then who wrote that check for $50,000? I did. You admit it? I do. Explain yourself. Well, we all know Larry Regan's profession. He had threatened my daughter. I preferred to buy him off rather than take a chance on the life of my child. So on January 6th, I gave him a check for $50,000. You mean you gave it to him on January 16th? No, on January 6th. This check is dated January 16th. Yes, <laughs> Reagan. He added a one and made it the 60th. You mean he changed the date? You may call a handwriting expert and find out. Kindly refrain from advising me. Your daughter and your fortune are your most cherished possessions, aren't they? They are. Then what would you do to the man who stole your money and deserted your daughter for another woman? We object, your honor. Objection sustained. You hated Faulkner. You wanted to break him. You suspected his intentions of staging, staging a suicide. The words Mr. Youngquist heard you say, prove it, didn't you? I suspected nothing of the kind. And on January 16th, didn't you spend the day following Faulkner? Certainly not. Didn't you follow him as soon as he left the penthouse that night? No. Didn't you have any particular information about Faulkner's activities at that time? None. You heard nothing unusual that day? Not a thing. You did not hear about the $80 million he transferred to Rio de Janeiro? I never heard of it. I killed him. I killed Bjorn Faulkner. I helped that man to kill him. The whole truth, so help me God. I didn't know, but I see it now. He killed Faulkner because he lied. He knew about the $80 million because I told him. Now look here, you can't be interrupted. That's all, Mr. Whitfield. No questions. Can I take the stand, Mr. Youngquist? You told Mr. Whitfield about that transfer? He asked me many times about the 80 million, where it spent. I did not know it was a secret. That day I tell him about Rio de Janeiro. That day at noon, January 16th. What kind of a frame up is this? Shh. You told Whitfield at noon. Yeah, I did. God help me. I didn't know. I would give my life for Air Fork now and I have to kill him. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Youngquist, were you alone with Mr. Whitfield when you told him? Yeah. Then it's the word of an ex-convict against John Graham Whitfield? Yeah. That's all. The bailiff will escort Mr. Youngquist from the courtroom. The defense may proceed with the closing arguments. Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in a few moments, you'll be called upon to decide the fate of a woman. Her very life rests in your hands, and I'm here to plead for that life. Karen Andre has confessed here to you many questionable things which may arouse you against her, but she is not being tried for those things. She's being tried only for the murder of Bjorn Faulkner. And to hold her, her guilty of that murder, you must convince yourself of two things that she had a motive, and that the evidence proves she committed the crime. What direct evidence has been submitted to you? Merely that Karen Andre threw a body from a penthouse. We admit that, but we deny that it was the body of Bjorn Faulkner. Now, what about the motive? In business, the lives of Karen Andre and Bjorn Faulkner were one. Think of Bjorn Faulkner. The state claims that he had reformed his methods that he became a devoted husband, that he dedicated his life to the task of saving his unfortunate investors. Do you believe that he was the kind to renounce his whole life and repent? If you do, she's guilty. But have you followed the testimony? After his marriage, he did not take his wife into his confidence and failed to explain his absence from her night after night. Was that the act of a devoted husband? On January 16th, 
he absconded with $80 million. Was that the act of a man trying to save his investors? When he realized that he could no longer hold off the collapse of his empire, he decided to stage a fake suicide. And to whom did he confide his plans? To his wife? No, to Karen Andre. Who was to meet him in South America? His wife? No, Karen Andre. There was every possible advantage to Karen Andre if Faulkner lived. She had no motive for killing him. We admit that Karen Andre helped Faulkner in his swindles. We admit that the story she told the inquest was a lie. But none of these things make her a murderess. Remember this. Karen Andre loved Faulkner. That is her only defense. Is it in you to understand her? Is it in you to understand the man that she loved? Who was on trial in this case? Karen Andre? No. It's you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, who are here on trial. It is your souls and minds and the very deepest secret chords of your hearts that will be brought to light when your decision is rendered. And I ask you for a verdict of not guilty. The district attorney will now give closing arguments. Your honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I am not going to appeal to your souls or to those deep secret chords of your hearts, but to your reason alone. I have no need to appeal to your sympathies for the only things that concern you in this case are the facts. And as I enumerate them to you, bear in mind that they are not manufactured alibis, but facts. Bjorn Faulkner was killed on the night of January 16th. He was murdered. His body was thrown from the parapet outside that penthouse by Karen Andre. And a detective from a nearby roof was an eyewitness to it. And that is a fact. He was already dead. He had been shot in that penthouse and the recently discharged gun was found in that apartment by the police. The defense claims that he fired the gun himself in an attempted suicide. But the gun bore the fingerprints of Karen Andre and of nobody else. And that is another fact. That gun was the property of Larry Regan who was in the apartment that night, although she had sworn that she had never seen him before. According to the testimony of the housekeeper, Larry Regan was her lover. And with him, she had conspired to ship $80 million to South America. Where did they get such a sum? By forging the name of John Graham Whitfield. And that is a fact, a fact which Karen Andre herself has admitted here on the witness stand. Now, why did they do all this? A child could give you the answer. Karen Andre hated Faulkner because he had married another woman and discharged her from his office. She was determined to accomplish two things. First, avenge herself on Faulkner and then seize his money and thus ensure for herself the depraved luxury to which she had become accustomed. <clears throat> and both of these things she planned with her new lover, Larry Regan. And so between them, they concocted this diabolically clever alibi, this confusion of corpses, this cock and bull story, the sheer impudence of which almost carried it to success. On January 16th, Lefty O'Toole was lured from his home in answer to a telephone call from Larry Regan and was later found dead. On January 16th, the money was sent to South America. On January 16th, Bjorn Faulkner was shot to death and his body hurled to the sidewalk so that the condition of his body might both conceal the bullet wound and make identification difficult. And then on the night of January 16th, the body of Lefty O'Toole was stolen and taken in an airplane to South County by Larry Regan and the plane and the body burned. 
And finally, a check for $50,000 was taken from John Graham Whitfield by blackmail. And then the date changed in the ridiculous attempt to implicate him in the crime. These are the facts in this case, a case so strong that I can conceive of no other verdict, the one I ask you to return, murder in the first degree. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the bailiff will now escort you to the jury room. I shall ask you to consider your verdict carefully, omitting all personal prejudices and sympathies. I ask you to adhere strictly to the evidence. To bear in mind the gun, the fingerprints on it, the admitted forgeries, and the motives which may have caused this crime to be committed. You are to determine whether Karen Andre is guilty or not guilty of the murder of Bjorn Faulkner. You may bring in a verdict of acquittal or of murder in the first degree. Well, the jury has begun its deliberation on this most serious and often confusing case. Perhaps while the jury decides the fate of Karen Andre, we should briefly reconsider some of the presentation of the facts in this case. I couldn't see his face because counting his hat was all crooked over his eyes and, and his collar, it was pulled up. It was a difficult undertaking, but I felt that the crash could have been prevented had Faulkner lived. I found only two valuable things on this earth my whip over the world, and Karen Andre. A certain peculiarity in the handwriting led me to claim this letter was forged. No lights. Karen Andre's white gown shimmering in the moonlight. She had a figure that make a bishop kick out a stained glass window. A man in evening clothes. Walter, he's leaning against the parapet. She pushes him over with all his strength. He goes over the parapet, down into space. It was impossible to determine it could have been the wound or the fall. But he realized his past mistakes. He was ready to atone for them when I came into his life. I didn't know, but I see now. He killed Faulkner because he lied. He knew about the $80 million because I told him. She asked me to put it on as hot as she can stand. And if it burned her shameless skin, she laughed like pagan she is and say it was man kissing her wild like tiger. He left the house to meet Regan. He was put on the spot in the landfill. Do you think we're both so low that if something passes us to which one kneels, we no longer have eyes to see it? I loved her. She loved Faulkner. That's our only proof. You are wrong. I am capable of murder for Bjorn Faulkner's sake. I've just been informed that the jury has completed its deliberation in record time, I might add. That could be good news for Karen Andre or bad. We'll know in a minute. This is Kara Sundlin Hughes for Court TV. Attention of the court. Prisoner will rise and face the jury. The jury will rise and face the prisoner. Mr. Foreman, have you reached a verdict? We have. What say you? Not guilty. One. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you. Your Honor, I, I ask that the prisoner be discharged. Prisoner face the court. The prisoner is discharged, but the court sees no reason to thank the jury for the verdict, which in my opinion is contrary to the evidence that was presented here. Therefore, I'm having your names struck from the jury rolls for five years. The court stands adjourned.